Jonathan Swift, or his alias Isaac Bickerstaff, is an Anglo-Irish author who was the most prominent prose satirist in the English language. Besides his celebrated novel, Gulliver's Travels in 1726, he wrote such shorter works as A Tale of a Tub in 1704, as well as A Modest Proposal in 1729. Swift's father died months before Jonathan was born, and his mother returned to England shortly after giving birth, leaving Jonathan in the care of his uncle in Dublin. Swift's extended family had several interesting literary connections. His grandmother, Elizabeth Dryden, was the niece of Sir Erasmus Dryden, grandfather of the poet John Dryden. Swift's uncle served as Jonathan's benefactor, sending him to Trinity College, Dublin, where he earned his Bachelor's of Arts and befriended writer William Congreve. Swift also studied towards his Master's of Arts before the Glorious Revolution of 1688 forced Jonathan to move to England. He would earn a Master's of Arts from Hart Hall, Oxford University, in 1692, and eventually a Doctor of Divinity degree from Trinity College, Dublin, in 1702. After a period working as a personal assistant to the English diplomat William Temple, he privately tutored Temple's young family friend, Esther Johnson, the Stella to whom many of Swift's poems are addressed to. From about 1690 to 1702, Swift served as a parish priest in rural Ireland. He was also writing at this time, producing works such as The Battle of the Books, a satirical account set in the library of a clash between ancient and modern books and the ideas contained in them. The Battle was published anonymously, aside a title of a tub, Swift's multi-layered prose satire of the habits of literacy critics and religious interpreters, whose cover claimed that it had been written for the universal improvement of mankind. Many of the critics at whom his satire was aimed at actually attempted and in some cases published explanations of the text's deliberate obscurity. In 1707, Swift was sent to London as emissary of Irish clergy, seeking remission of tax on Irish clerical incomes. His requests were rejected, however, by the Whig government and by Queen Anne, who suspected him of being irreligious. While in London, he met Esther Van Holmry, who would become his Vanessa. During the next few years, he went back and forth between Ireland and England, where he was involved largely as an observer rather than a participant in the highest English political circles. In 1708, Swift published his Bickerstaff papers, satirical attacks upon an astrologer, John Partridge, and a series of ironic pamphlets on church questions, including an argument against abolishing Christianity. In 1710, which saw the publication of a description of a city shower, Swift, disgusted with their alliance with the dissenters, fell out with the Whigs, allied himself with the Tories, and became the editor of the Tory newspaper, The Examiner. Between 1710 and 1713, he also wrote the famous series of letters to Esther Johnson, which would eventually be published as the Journal to Stella. In 1713, Swift was installed as Dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. Not long after the celebration of his most successful 1726 work, Gulliver's Travels, Swift's longtime love, Esther Johnson, fell ill. She died in January 1728. Her life's end moved Swift to write The Death of Miss Johnson. Shortly after her death, a stream of Swift's other friends also died, including John Gay and John Arbuthnot. Swift, always bolstered by the people around him, was now quite troubled. In 1742, Swift suffered from a stroke and lost the ability to speak. On October 19, 1745, Swift died. He was laid to rest next to Esther Johnson inside Dublin's St. Patrick's Cathedral. Today, we are going to take a look at my modern adaptation of Swift's work, A Modest Proposal. I have heavily modified his original work to make more sense in a modern context removing most references to politics of that era. I also changed most of the vocabulary so that it could be understood by a more general audience. While a lot different from the original, 
It was my goal to keep the fundamentals of Swift's ideas intact. Politically, everything falls in line with that of the original text, and as the nature of this being satire, I do not endorse any of the beliefs stated in this translation. Thank you, and please enjoy. It is a melancholy object to those who travel through this great nation. When they see the streets, roads, and alleyways crowded with homeless beggars, followed by three, four, six children, all in torn, dirty clothes, and promptuing every wayfarer in sight for mere quarters. Homeless mothers, instead of being able to work for their honest livelihood, are forced to employ all of their time in strolling to beg sustenance for their helpless infants, who as they grow up either turn to crime, or work simple jobs with paychecks that can barely sustain one human life. I think that both parties agree that the monstrous amount of children forced into the arms, backs, or at the heels of their unfortunate mothers and fathers in our present deplorable state of the nation is a very great grievance. And therefore, whoever could find out a fair, cheap, and easy method of making these children sound and useful members of the commonwealth would deserve so well of the public they should be celebrated as a hero. <laughs> My intention does more than provide only for the children of professed beggars. It will take in a whole number of children at a certain age who are raised by parents that are barely able to support them. I have thought of my plan for many years, upon this important subject and maturely weighted several alternative concepts from different scholars. I have always found them largely mistaken in their computation. It is true that a child just born may live off of breast milk for over a year with little other nourishment, but past that, the cost of sustenance for their child increases exponentially. At exactly one year old, I propose to provide for them in such a manner as instead of being a charge upon their parents or orphanages or wanting food and remnant for the rest of their lives, they shall, on the contrary, contribute to the feeding and probably to the clothing of millions. There is also another great advantage in my scheme that will prevent those evil voluntary abortions and that horrid practice of women murdering their bastard children, frequently sacrificing poor innocent babies to avoid the expense to draw tears and pity in the most savage and human people. I calculated that 9% of all American families are in poverty. I will also take an account for these women who miscarry or whose children die by accident or disease within one year. The question therefore is, how this number shall be raised and provided for, which, as I have already said, under the present situation of affairs, it is utterly impossible by all methods currently proposed. For we can't employ children in handicraft or agriculture, nor construction or land cultivation. They can very seldom pick up a livelihood by stealing, at least until they are about six years old. Although I confess they learn the rudiments much earlier, during which time they can however be properly looked upon as a novice, as I have been informed by multiple companies who confirm to me that they know a handful of child workers under the age of six. I am assured by our industries that a boy or a girl before 12 years old is no sellable commodity and even when they come to this age they would be worth almost nothing. Which surely cannot account for the money lost of either the parents or the government funding, the charge of nourishment and clothing being at least four times what they are worth. I will now humbly propose my own thoughts, which I know are almost too genius to be criticized. <laughs> I have been assured by professional nutritionists and dietitians that a healthy one-year-old child, well-nourished, is a very delicious, nourishing, and a wholesome food whenever stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled, and I make no doubt that it will serve well in any dish. I must tell you that there is nothing morally wrong with eating your own children. For example, this is seen in nature with other mammals, such as the house hamster. Hamster mothers are very often seen eating their own children, 
In fact, they love it so much that you have to separate the children from the hamster at birth. I do, therefore, humbly offer it to the public consideration that of the children already computed, 25% may be reserved for repopulation. The remaining thousands may at a year old be offered in the sale to middle and upper class families around the country. It will encourage the mothers to let them feed plentifully in the last month, so that they are plump and fat for a good table. A child will make two dishes at a party, with friends, and when the family dines alone, the four hind quarter will make a reasonable dish, and seasoned with a little bit of pepper or salt will be very good boiled on the fourth day of leftovers, especially in winter. I reckon on average, a child just born will weigh 12 pounds, and in a year, if well nourished, increase to 28 pounds. On average, about $60 will be the price for the carcass of a good fat child, which, I have said, will be suitable for at least four meals of excellent, nutritious meat. The carcass could be filleted, and the skin being sold to thrifty and fashionable clothing brands to produce admirable gloves for ladies and perhaps fine shoes for the rich folk. Could you imagine the glory of ear pods made of the bones of children, or perhaps ivory of the child's teeth used in earrings or other jewelry? I think the advantages of my proposal are very clear, but I will continue further. Poorer households will have something profitable of their own, which by law could be made a requirement, and help to pay their landlord's rent or their own food, and allow them to own more goods. Whereas, the price of maintenance of thousands of children from two years old and upwards will be mostly non-existent. The nation's stock will thereby increase greatly. This isn't even counting the profits of a new dish introduced to the tables of the upper class who have excellent taste. And the money the money will circulate among ourselves, the goods being entirely of our own growth and manufacture. The mothers who breed will gain extra money every year based on these sales. And obviously, they will not need to worry about the increasing costs of parenting older kids. This food would likewise bring great custom to restaurants and cafes where the chefs will certainly be so prudent as to procure the best recipes for dressing it to perfection, and consequently their businesses will boom. Those chefs of high skill who understand how to oblige their guests will contrive to make these dishes as expensive as they please. This would cause a great increase to marriage, which all wise nations have likely either encouraged it by rewards or enforced it by laws and penalties. We should soon see an honest praise for a married woman who could raise the fattest child for the market. In return, men would become more fond of their wives during the time of their pregnancy and more helpful to the raising of their human livestock. Many other advantages might be realized too. For instance, the addition of some thousand carcasses in our exportation of meat. Swan or cow tastes like nothing in comparison to the magnificence of a well-grown, fat one-year-old child, which roasted whole will make a considerable figure at a holiday feast or any other public entertainment, and will undoubtedly be very popular worldwide. I can think of not one objection that one could possibly raise against this proposal, no one can simply argue against a booming national economy, new materials of great luxury, a realization of pride, vanity and duty and self-worth in our women, introducing a vein, a parsimony, prudence and temperance, and lastly, putting a spirit of honesty, industry and skill into our corporations who have more reason to use our native good to put business back into our country. Therefore, I repeat, anyone who disagrees is blatantly wrong, 
and I will refuse to listen to them until they try to give at least some sort of sincere attempt to put my proposal into practice and see for themselves. However, I am not so violently bent upon my own opinion as to reject any other proposed by other scholars which must be found equally innocent, cheap, easy, and as effective as my own. But before something of that kind shall be shown in contradiction to my scheme, and offering a better concept, I hope that the author or authors will consider these two points. First, as things now stand, how will they be able to find food and clothing for millions of useless mouths? And secondly, there is also millions of unfortunate and poor people. I desire those politicians who dislike my ideas to attempt to question these homeless mortals. Whatever they think it would have been better to have been sold for food at a year old in the manner I prescribe, and therefore could have avoided such terrible misfortunes as they have since gone through. I profess in the sincerity of my heart that I have not the least personal interest in endeavoring to promote this necessary work, having no other motive than to do the public good. By advancing our trade, providing for infants, relieving the poor, and giving more pleasure to the rich. I have no children by which I can propose to get a single penny.